The year is 1532. Inca civilization is at its height. In less than a century, they've grown into the greatest power in the Americas. On this day, the bloody civil war is ended. His name is Atahualpa. In the tradition of his ancestors, Atahualpa drinks from the skull of his opponent, a skull lined with gold. It's the skull of Atahualpa's brother. Atahualpa and the Inca thrived in a rugged, inhospitable region where few could even survive. Shaken by earthquakes and volcanoes, the towering peaks of their homeland had air so thin, visitors gasped for breath. And coastal deserts so dry, they turned men into mummies. Against all odds, the Inca rose out of a long line of civilizations who survived here for centuries. Civilizations like the Tiwanaku and Moche, Paracas and Nazca, Ica Chincha, Chancay and Chimu, the Inca's mysterious ancestors. Some built great cities that today are melting into mud or wove stories in cloth wrapped around their dead some honored ancestors worshiping their mummies. Some are remembered by exquisite treasures, others by age-old secrets, haunting images etched in the desert floor. But the best known of all, the Inca, would last barely 100 years. Soon after Atahualpa took power, a tiny but well-armed force of Spaniards would invade, threatening all the Inca had created. The most powerful empire in the Americas believed itself invincible. Their realm rivaled the size of the Roman Empire. Their system of roads could have stretched halfway around the earth. They had a vast fighting force that was tested in battle. With a genius for engineering, they had tamed some of the most rugged lands on Earth. Their messengers covered 250 miles a day, even bearing fresh fish from sea level to 12,000 feet. They worshiped many gods, but believed the sun, called Inti, was their spiritual father. Many of their most glorious creations endure. This magnificent city is one of many mysteries the Inca left behind. For centuries it lay hidden from the outside world, its purpose unknown, even to their descendants. 
It is called Machu Picchu. In 1911, Hiram Bingham, an American adventurer, led an expedition to Peru searching for the legendary lost stronghold of the Inca, Vilcabamba. After weeks of frustration, Bingham followed a tip along a tortuous route high into the mountains. Soon, his struggle would all be worthwhile. Suddenly, I found myself confronted with the walls of ruined houses built of the finest quality Inca stonework. It was hard to see them, for they were partly covered with the growth of centuries. It seemed like an unbelievable dream. For 400 years, Machu Picchu stood in silence at the top of the world. Now the last great sanctuary of the Inca was revealed. Unknown to their conquerors for centuries, this city in the sky embodies all the mysteries of the great cultures that came before them. Of all great civilizations of antiquity, the Inca and their predecessors had to master global extremes and environmental conditions. And with this went a system of organizing life socially, economically, and religiously that is extremely marvelous. If we can understand the mindset of these people that allowed them to survive and thrive, we will have a great key to true masters of the largest civilization in the Americas. And that is a mystery that we have been trying to solve. The Inca and their ancestors thrived by adapting to an unforgiving environment. Their bodies evolved, developing larger lungs and short, powerful legs to negotiate the steep mountain terrain. They domesticated animals like llama and alpaca, providing meat and wool for warm clothing. And perhaps most importantly, they cultivated a vast array of crops that would thrive in the diverse environment of the region. Corn was the most valued. They grew tomatoes and peanuts and over 200 types of potatoes. They cultivated cocoa plants, chewing the leaves to ward off hunger and fatigue. Generation upon generation had survived here, each building on the successes and learning from the failures of those who preceded them. As the population grew, they reshaped the landscape to meet their needs. Rivers were straightened, canals dug, and millions of acres of mountainside carved into terraced farmland. Like stairs to the heavens, they amazed the Spanish, who called the mountain range by their word for terrace, Andines. Though the Inca are credited with creating the terraces, many were built by their ancestors. And when the Spanish arrived, they just ascribed everything to the Inca, paid not a great deal of attention to the many civilizations, the many tribes, the many groups that the Inca incorporated. It wasn't until the turn of the century that archaeologists began to discover that there were marvelous ruins that predated the Inca by thousands of years, that the Inca were simply the political culmination of 10,000 years of adaptation to high mountains, to jungles, to deserts. These cultures were as varied as the regions they sprang from, but each had to master some of the harshest terrain and most severe weather anywhere on Earth. To the east, the Amazon, the world's largest tropical rainforest. Running west to the Pacific, 
the driest desert on earth, home to the Nazca, the people of Paracas, and the Moche. Wedged in between the rocky spine of the Andes, the world's longest mountain range, it is second in height only to the Himalayas. This was the homeland of the Inca. Here they thrived, despite the constant rumbling of volcanoes and earthquakes, shattering their cities and destroying the canals that were their lifeline. If you shake that landscape forcefully, those canal systems will break down, and it takes a very long time to rebuild them. It's an entirely different world, a world of high altitude, lack of oxygen, scanty rainfall, earthquakes, natural disasters. It's a world that's alive. The Inca and their ancestors stood in awe of the power of nature. In addition to Inti, the sun god, they worshiped the mountains, the earth, thunder, and the moon. They expanded their pantheon with each new people they conquered, incorporating new idols and spirits as their own. But all people of the region agreed on one universal creator called Viracocha. As the Inca left no written record, we know their gods as we know much of Indian life from chronicles of the Spaniards. Pedro de Cieza de Leon arrived in 1535. The Indians say that for many days the world was in darkness, and then they emerge from the island of Titicaca, the sun in its splendor, at which all rejoiced. And there came a man, large of stature, who had great powers. They called him Father of the Sun. Just as Viracocha was the father of the sun, so each Inca leader was the son of the sun. And in 1532, that man was Atahualpa. He and his people were masters of their world. At his royal estate of Pisac, there was a temple in honor of the sun god Inti. Though this was a sacred site, a fortress protected the emperor, his court, and the rich farmland on the terraces below. With a commanding view of the valley, it was designed to defend against the wild Amazonian tribes to the east. But soon, a new enemy would appear, an enemy in search of gold, armed with their own god and powerful new weapons an enemy that would threaten to destroy all the Inca had created. Inca emperors lived a life of extraordinary opulence. Atahualpa had many wives, and his choice of the most beautiful Inca women to serve his every need. His sacred body was clothed in the finest garments, worn once, then ceremonially burned. He ruled with absolute authority. In the empire's most lavish festival, he was honored as a living god. Held on the winter solstice in Cusco, the Inca capital, the festival of Inti Raymi celebrated the sun and all its abundant gifts. The Spanish outlawed Inti Raymi, but it was revived earlier this century. Like many Inca traditions, Inti Raymi honors ancestors. 
believers in God, in their emperor, and in their own hard work. This system of belief recognized one's ancestors as being extremely important. Your grandfather, your great-grandfather, established where you would be in society. And because ancestors were so important, these folks engaged in what we call ancestor veneration, worshiping your ancestors. A major part of that was making sure that the ancestral body was kept intact. And to accomplish this, mummification of bodies became very, very important. The dead emperor would be embalmed, kept in his palace, but in a quasi-alive state. The mummy was brought out and seated with his ancestral mummies on all important occasions. If we were going to go to war as Inca, we would consult the deceased to make sure that we had their blessing. This Inca court of the dead was called the Panaca. But mummification in the region predates the Inca by nearly 5,000 years. In the arid deserts of the Peruvian coast, bodies naturally resist decay. Hundreds of burial grounds dot the landscape. Today, these remains reveal much about the past. This should be about a thousand years old. Either a young adult or female because of the size of the bundle. Compared to other bundles, the wrappings are very simple. So that probably gives a suggestion of her position within the society. Of the feet bones, I thought we might be dealing with a young adult female. The skin is all right in many areas like here. Muscles have almost completely disappeared. So I'm removing this second wrapping on the area that we should be finding the face. And uh, but the hair is there. It has a hairdo that includes braids. Echoes of ancestors are everywhere, preserved in the drifting desert sands. Despite the harshness of the coastal desert, advanced civilizations thrived here. In 1925, two archaeologists traveled to a lonely outpost in southern Peru called Paracas, or sand falling like rain. They are drawn by reports of a large burial site in the desert. One is a Peruvian, Julio Tello, his colleague American, Samuel Lothrop. It is astonishing that such advanced cultures could have developed in this beautiful but barren setting. But more and more, remarkable artifacts were showing up on the black market. And out here, the evidence is even stronger. Teo and Lothrop had discovered the remains of a little-known civilization. The Paracas predated the Inca by 1,500 years. Of the many wonders they uncovered here, most mystifying of all were the bizarrely deformed skulls scattered across the sand. They surmised that heads of babies were bound between wooden boards to produce the grotesque elongation.
The deforming of the skulls began when a child was born and continued until they were three or four years old. Only a small percentage of deformed skulls have been found, indicating it was practiced only among the elite or highest classes. Even more remarkable still were skulls with holes drilled or cut into them, a procedure called trephination. Trephination was initially a form of surgery for fractured skulls, but later on it was used in rituals to allow malignancy or diseases to escape. Remarkably, we know that about 60% of the people who had this procedure performed survived the operation. We know they survived because many trephinated skulls show signs of healing. The patient was usually given chicha, a strong brew, to help him relax, while the surgeon used tools of copper and bronze. Some operations involved cutting a series of grooves in the skull. Others, drilling a circular hole so a piece of bone could be lifted out. Centuries before the advent of modern science, these ancestors of the Inca performed medical miracles. But the full explanation for this bizarre practice remains shrouded in mystery. Perhaps the greatest enigma of all the mysteries left by the Inca and their little known ancestors is that of a people called the Nazca. The Nazca thrived in the coastal valleys where water is scarce and the sun's rays unmerciful. Like the Inca, the Nazca worshiped the gods of nature, the sun, moon, and stars. In the desert, they constructed lines and symbols that mystify to this day. For them, the desert may have been a cathedral for sacred prayer, a celestial calendar to mark the seasons, or some have claimed a giant canvas for messages to ancient space travelers, creatures from other worlds. We may never know. All that remains of the Nazca now are giant riddles in the desert sand, mysteries that have baffled scientists and spawned a controversy bordering on science fiction. The Nazca Lines stretch over 135 miles of desert. This bird is 450 feet long. Others are simply straight lines that run for miles on end. Though they can be seen clearly from the air, on the ground they are barely visible. For over a thousand years, they remained unknown to the outside world. It wasn't until the 1920s that airline pilots began referring to the prehistoric airstrips. Before long, there were as many theories as there are lines on the desert floor. I tried to prove that this planet has been visited by beings from outer space several times in antiquity. In 1968, Eric von Daniken's Chariots of the Gods fueled a wild scientific debate. His thesis, the Nazca were communicating with visitors from outer space. By the landing itself, some sand and stones are blown away and you have a simple track on the ground. And after maybe a few hours or a few days, they start again, maybe in another direction, you have a second track, the take-off track. I assumed that only later, when the extraterrestrials uh, departed, the natives came to the ground and saw these two lines, landing track and take-off track, and they would whisper, the fiery gods rode on these lines. Serious scholars dismissed von Daniken's work in favor of more down-to-earth explanations. One woman had her own theories. Since 1941, 
Maria Rijka has devoted her life to unlocking the mysteries carved in the desert floor. I started walking just to see what was there. I walked on a line and suddenly I found myself at the center of lines and followed a little further and found winding pathways which proved to be the figure of the spider. And from then on, I was immersed in all this vastness and I just looked for small winding pathways to see if there could be a figure. Reich has spent years carefully measuring the lines and plotting their relationship to the movements of the sun, moon, and stars. She concluded the geometric lines are a giant astronomical calendar telling the ancient Nazca when to plant, irrigate, and harvest their crops. While her science may be sound, some feel she overlooked an important point. Somehow, she neglected the anthropological part. She didn't account for who made these lines. The evidence implies that since a lot of people worked at building these hundreds of lines, they must have had a ceremonial significance. They were some kind of ritual road that led people to certain important centers. It is likely that these lines were placed where dances and rituals were practiced. This is the annual pilgrimage to the Andean shrine of Koya Riti. Every year, the faithful from villages across the region follow ancient pathways to honor the gods who dwell in the mountains above. At the ceremony's climax, the Indians form giant human lines in view of the surrounding peaks and in praise of their gods. One of the festival's more curious rituals is a ceremonial piece of ice carried from a high glacier down to the lines of believers below, symbolizing the waters that bring life to dry desert towns like Nazca. The mysterious relationship between the lines and the water has fascinated many. Eduardo Heran, a photographer, believes the lines were drawn to guide birds whose arrival signals the coming of the rains. The Nazca needed water, and it's possible that they designed the lines for the condors to see. When the condors fly over the lines, they are announcing that the rain from the Andes is on its way, that water is coming. And that's very important for the Nazcans. During the last years, we have identified nearly 300 new drawings. It's most important to be aware that Nazca is a unique monument, that it doesn't exist in any other part of the world. Today, it's easy to marvel at the lines from the air. Could the ancient Nazcans have flown as well? In 1975, adventurer Jim Woodman and balloonist Julian Knott attempted to prove they could by building a hot air balloon using materials the ancients would have had in ready supply. They used reeds for the basket, and cotton cloth for the envelope. They funneled heat from a fire pit and lifted off, flying over the desert for two glorious minutes. The lines have outlasted the people who made them by thousands of years. Surviving earthquake, drought, and downpour. Epitomizing the endurance of Andean cultures in the face of nature's overwhelming powers. But another force was gathering strength on the horizon. 
one that neither the Nazca nor the Inca could ever have foreseen. A force that would appear as alien to Atahualpa as a man from outer space. In 1532, Francisco Pizarro and his small band of conquistadors invaded Peru in search of shimmering cities of gold. Though vastly outnumbered, they had two weapons that would prove formidable in battle. Their firearms, though not very accurate and slow to reload, devastated an Indian army accustomed to closer combat. The Spanish had horses, which had never been seen before. One 16th century chronicler wrote, The Indians were so terrified by the furious onrush of horses that they dared not appear in an open field, for ten horses could disperse a thousand Indians. To the Inca, the Spanish must have seemed like creatures from another planet, with their suits of armor and strange four-legged beasts. They inspired a mixture of fear and disbelief. On November 16, 1532, Pizarro and his men would come face to face with Atahualpa. The event was recreated in the feature film, The Royal Hunt of the Sun. The Spaniards were only 168 strong. More than 80,000 Inca warriors camped nearby. But Atahualpa and his entourage of thousands came unarmed. He had no idea the Spanish might fight. His plan was to capture their horses for breeding. On a signal, Pizarro's troops attacked. By day's end, 6,000 Inca were dead yet not a single Spaniard. Atahualpa escaped with his life, but Pizarro took him captive. To gain his freedom, Atahualpa proposed a sensational ransom. He pointed to a spot high on the wall of his cell and offered to fill the room with gold. The chamber was roughly 22 feet long by 17 feet wide. Pizarro doubted it could be done, but gave Atahualpa two months to keep his pledge. Every corner of the empire was scoured for treasure, some dating back centuries, much of it captured by the Inca as their empire expanded. Many of the most finely crafted pieces were made by the Moche people of northern Peru. The Moche flourished at about the same time as the Nazca in the south, reaching their height around 500 AD. This is the Moche Temple of the Sun, 
Once the largest pyramid in the Americas, it was built of more than 140 million adobe bricks. Believing it held a hoard of gold, the Spanish diverted the Moche River, washing away nearly two-thirds of this enormous structure and revealing astounding riches. The Moche kingdom was small compared to the Inca, but it was fabulously wealthy. For the elite, it was a life of high ceremony and bloody human sacrifice. The common people were rigidly organized and worked hard to build the state. Fertile fields were watered by elaborate irrigation systems, making their coastal valleys among the richest in all Peru. And they reaped the bounty of the Pacific Ocean. Descendants of the Moche still fish as they have for centuries. Strong men in reed boats casting their nets on the waters. The Moche rulers supported an extraordinary class of artisans and a highly organized religion. The images on their temple walls and ceramic pots hinted a life for the nobility filled with enigmatic ritual and erotic sexual practices. At a site near the city of Trujillo, a series of adobe friezes give a chilling look into Moche life. It is called El Brujo. Local people had known about El Brujo for years and often searched for artifacts to sell on the black market. One was Arturo Carrera, who discovered the friezes in 1983. <laughs> First we found a mummy bundle, and as we moved it, we saw the relief of the facade. Reliefs so beautiful that impressed us so much that we covered them with dirt and decided not to tell anybody. They were so beautiful that we were afraid others would come back and destroy them or rob them. The majesty of the artwork finally awoke the conscience of a thief. Arturo and his friends shared their secret with the authorities. Today, he works with the team deciphering El Brujo's mysteries. It's called El Brujo, which is the Spanish word for sorcerer, because this temple was probably occupied as by a powerful shaman or a warrior priest in the past. What we see in this panel is a line of naked prisoners tied together with a rope around their neck. These prisoners are almost surely being led to their execution. The many human remains suggest the friezes are depicting what really happened at El Brujo. The big question is, what is the real meaning of the sacrifice? And the sacrifice itself is a conscious act of killing somebody in a symbolic way. It's the most precious good you can give. Somehow, if this big building is here, with all these images around, and all this art, fabulous art of Moche people, and we didn't find the real relationship between the art and the reality. In Moche iconography, it's very common to see images of sorcery or curing. And it is interesting to see that still in practice today, The ancient art is no longer practiced by warrior priests. Humans are no longer sacrificed. Today, curanderos are healers, using herbs and potions to cure ailments of the body and magic to ward off evil forces that prey on the spirit. I cure not only God's diseases, but also those that come from evil means. 
For instance, I cure an evil air, an epilepsy, a mental disturbance in the brain, all these things. Among the curandero's potions is a powerful hallucinogen made from the San Pedro cactus. Another highly destructive ancient tradition survives here as well. These are the Waqueros, grave robbers, who sell relics of their ancestors on the black market. The poor farmers of Peru are encouraged to plunder the tombs of their ancestors by the growing black market in artifacts of the United States and Europe. In October of 1987, I was called by the police to help in identifying some recently seized artifacts. But upon my arrival, they showed me the most impressive treasure. Among them was an impressive gold head with eyes of silver and lapis lazuli. The treasure came from a looted tomb near the town of Sipan. Townspeople swarmed over the site, searching a massive pit dug by the looters. The police arrived the next day to restore order. The looted treasures had to be a sign of greater riches hidden within. Alva and his team began to dig. After sifting through the rubble for days, they focused on a 10-meter plot near the summit. What they found was a bounty that had eluded scientists and looters alike, a royal burial chamber, untouched for 1,500 years. It was a remarkable discovery. For the first time, we archaeologists had the opportunity to document the tomb of an important man from ancient Peru. In this tomb, we felt we were not alone, that there was a deep spiritual presence. We were resurrecting a character from his 1,700-year-long rest. We decided to call him the Lord of Sipan. He was about 35, perhaps five and a half feet tall. He was surrounded by men and women, even a dog, no doubt his companions in life. And to his grave he took a staggering array of wealth. His skull and face were layered with gold, silver, and copper ornaments. He wore gold and turquoise earrings with a miniature warrior and battle dress in the center. Fully excavated, the Lord of Sipan's tomb was judged to be the richest in the Americas. For Alva and his colleagues, it was the discovery of a lifetime. I can remember when I was 15. I took my first picture of this site, despite the fact that I lived very far away. I had come here without a thought of what destiny had in store for me. When I discovered the tomb, it was the fulfillment of a personal dream, as well as a professional goal, to show Peruvians that archaeology is alive, that we are here to recover the roots of the Peruvian nation, and that the Peruvians should feel proud of their extraordinary past.
The Moche reign came to an end between 650 and 800 AD. A combination of earthquake and drought probably turned their farmland back to desert. Another in a long line of great Andean civilizations, finally overwhelmed by the forces of nature. For the Inca, the end of their empire came differently. For months, the ransom raised by Atahualpa was carried to his jail cell, and the hoard of treasure rose closer and closer to the line on the wall. Yet in the end, Atahualpa was condemned to die. He pleaded he would be denied reincarnation if burned at the stake. So instead, Atahualpa was tied to a chair and choked to death. His treasure was melted down to feed the fortunes of the King of Spain. Though their empire was defeated, the royal Inca mummies continued to be worshipped in secret. But these powerful symbols of Inca tradition were a threat to the Catholic Church, which was trying to convert the masses to Christianity. Finally, the mummies were sent to Lima for a Christian burial, to put an end to the pagan practices. The 16th century chronicler Garcilaso de la Vega described their departure from Cusco. They were wrapped in white sheets, and the Indians knelt and bowed, sobbing with tears as they passed. The Spanish, too, took off their hats, since these were royal bodies. <laughs> 